the Western world knew about the murder of the Jews of Poland, that is, knew in the sense of had information about, almost from the moment it began. And they had it, and they had the information by what you might think of as a rather unlikely route. The we think of the war as the, the happening where we could not, because we were at war with Nazi Germany, Britain, the United States, so on. We couldn't get information out of what was going on within the Nazi Empire. But there were neutral countries that had their citizens living in these places. There were Swedes in Warsaw. There were Swiss people in Warsaw. There in fact was a Swiss dye factory in a little city called Pabianice, which is right outside of Warsaw. The manager of the Swiss dye factory in Pabianice saw the roundups of the Jews, saw people being shot as they were being put into the ghettos and so forth, reported the information back to his headquarters in Switzerland. In turn, the managers in Switzerland who heard this information talked to the head of the International Red Cross, whose headquarters was in Geneva, Switzerland, and told him the stories of what they were hearing. Catholic priests in the areas of Poland where the killings were taking place reported back to their bishops who reported to the Vatican. By the spring of 1942, we already knew that there were large-scale killings taking place. We didn't quite know how all the people were being killed. Gas was not universally understood to be what was happening in the camps. There were stories that said, oh, the Jews are all being deported to these places. They're being electrocuted. This was one of the rumors that came out and so forth. Now, by the fall of 1942, that kind of information is becoming much more secure and reliable. But who knew about it? It was on the in the interior pages of American newspapers. Worse, the authorities in Britain in particular, to a lesser extent in Washington, wanted to downplay the information. They did not want to report the full extent of what they knew, much of which came from the Polish underground, because that would create the impression that the Allies were fighting the war for the Jews. And in Britain and the United States, there was a good deal of domestic anti-Semitism. And the policymakers were afraid, if it looks like we're fighting the war for the Jews, or it looks like this war is all about the survival of the Jews, that will undermine commitment to the war at home. So what you had was a series of things impeding knowledge. Information was there. But there were people who didn't want to spread the information. There were people who decided that the information isn't as important as other things. Um, and then there was the natural problem of information not quite reaching the people who read the newspaper. If you read the newspaper in the morning from cover to cover, how much did you remember? Did you remember what was on the first page, which might be about American troops fighting somewhere? If you were an American citizen reading the paper, you cared about your troops. You may not remember what was on page 15 or, or 20. I sometimes describe this to American audiences with a personal story. My, my dad, uh, my father fought in the Pacific. Um, my father was trained to be a bomber, and he uh, was involved in the war against Japan. When I was growing up in the 1950s, in my home, World War II was about Japan. None of my relatives had fought in Europe. So all of my stories were about Japan. But of course, if you then look at the history books, Europe is much more important. Two-thirds of the American casualties in World War II died in Europe. They didn't die in Japan. But for me, the war was about Japan. We all have our individual optic that we bring to these subjects. And that distorts the way in which information becomes knowledge.